different person, um, but you know, certain circumstances, and uh, you know, he uh, has agreed to do this uh, virtually. And you know, B Byron really doesn't need an introduction, but the thing I want to uh, highlight is he's done the hardest thing, which is uh, make uh, you know an economic case to the management for uh, the power of formal methods and. Uh, <laughs> you know the the uh, value that it uh, delivers in in a in a commercial setting um in in fact you know many of these companies companies like amazon they they thrive on the trust that people place on their software that you know you click a button here and a box shows up at your door so uh, you know and they also offer services to people who uh, rely on uh, you know clear semantics so uh, you know i think you know what byron's doing is you know, just beyond uh, words. I, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, show enough appreciation for it. It's just incredible. So, Byron. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so this is going to be a, a somewhat non-standard talk. It's uh, it's it's somewhere in the mixture of tech on, on, on you know formal methods, but also business. It's actually it's going to really. Hit at, the, hit at the point that was just made there, that it's, it's at the intersection of business, uh, organizational theory, psychology, um, and, and formal methods. So, um, and along the way, I'm gonna point to um, uh, some papers that are available on the, on the Amazon science, science website. So the context of this is that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm speaking at PLDI, or I'm speaking at uh, Uppsala, or I'm speaking at Flock, and, and folks are asking me, why, why has Amazon been so successful in formal reasoning when, when others, in the, at least in the software space, aren't as successful? So they, Amazon has made pretty remarkable investments in it. And we don't see this at other software places. We do see this in, to some degree in, in hardware and uh, in aerospace, but, but less so in, um, in um, in, in, in software. So, and, you know, to, to provide a bit of context, so here, for example, is the uh, senior vice president of AWS engineering speaking uh, about automated reasoning and, and fairly in front of a fairly sizable crowd. You have the CEO, the CTO, the chief information security officer all speaking about it. Here's a, um, an interview that the CTO did with me uh, I exclusively, you know, on, on formal methods because it's you know it's with me, and then here's the VP and distinguished engineer of the AWS security organization giving an hour long talk entirely dedicated to uh, automated reasoning. Here's the VP of the compliance organization AWS and one of our third party compliance auditors talking about how uh, automated reasoning is is changing the game for 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 AWS. And we have a number of features. Their customer facing. So, for example, VPC reachability analyzer, uh, managed config rules, uh, S3 block public access, IM access analyzer, uh, IoT events, and then and things like the um, recently released encryption SDK, which uh, which is which is which is written in Daphne. And across AWS's products, you know, look at any any product from AWS. It has there are some formal methods happening now in that space. And so, um, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're basically touching the entire thing. So, I mean, really as an extreme example, the TLS implementation used across Amazon, uh, we've done pretty extensive work in formal methods. So, you know, this, this paper's now four, four years old, uh, but we've, we've been, we have been for, for, for some time proving the correctness of the, the TLS implementation at the LLVM level. Um, and so you can see these um, proofs on, on, on Travis CI. And then more recently, we've been working on, there's something called the AWS Lib Crypto, uh, which, which the formal methods team has also been um, uh, applying, you know, re reasoning to. And you, and you can find that available. And so we have hundreds of full-time formal methods folks working. We have, you know, one of the largest teams I would say ever. And I think this year we're going to have 95 PhD student interns in, in formal methods working with us. And there's a number of, of folks you might know. So this is the folks with principal in their title, right? So that, there's a lot more, but I, I, I couldn't list them all. So I just chose to list the, 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 more, the more senior folks. So those are the people with, with principal somewhere in their title. And I've left a question mark because there's a few of you um, 
in the audience of, that are, are, are potentially joining us. So sort of what's that other placeholder? But the, the, you, may, you might know some of these folks. And we also have um, a number of part-time academics. So these are folks that are on, you know, 20% time where they come summers or, um, and they're, they are actually Amazon employees, uh, but, but they're joint, they're joint, they have joint positions with, with the university. And we have, we also sp sponsoring a number of uh, academics. And so we're working in a wide range of spaces from storage to automating uh, application security reviews to, uh, you know, like with our investments in Rust and we're in programming languages and devices and uh, payments and, uh, you know, authorization and, and, and you name it, the, the list goes really go, goes on and on and on. So that's, that's, that's the context. Why has Amazon been so, so successful and, and others haven't um, in, in the software space? And so I think uh, for, from my perspective, it's really these four Amazon concepts. So I, so I think that it's these four concepts from Amazon that have been really crucial to our success and has really taught me a lot, but also taught a lot to the others who have joined Amazon and, and I tried to apply full methods there. Um, and so what I wanted to do in this talk was to try and, you know, like not everyone, as, as hard as I try, I'm not gonna be able to get everyone to work at Amazon. And, um, and so I wanted to try and convey in non-Amazon terms, w w what those are and, and perhaps how, how those could be, those ideas could be pulled out of the Amazon context and into the industrial, to, to, into other companies or to, um, the academic environment and how we can sort of adapt them um, and, and, and maybe gain some of the value that we've gained internally. I also wanted to provide some thoughts for younger researchers who are uh, perhaps watching this and thinking about their next career moves. And obviously I'm gonna try and uh, convince you to join Amazon, but, 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 but in general, I think there's ways, I think that we've figured out stuff that, that will be helpful to you no matter, no matter where you work. Um, and then also obviously thoughts for academics who, who, are, who are producing students that we are um that we're hiring um and then and then if you're trying to collaborate with amazon too it's probably good to understand kind of how things how things are working and then one other thing is i, I did i want to include a slide on sort of open um the things things that were that we're trying to figure out um, so that, that you might find interesting okay so let's let's just go through each of these four so the first one is called the um, amazon virtuous cycle and and if you Google Amazon virtual cycle, you're going to see you're going to see a lot of photos like this. They're all basically the same. I thought I'd just walk through it. So the idea is that this is really the fundamental concept of how Amazon works. Is you know more traffic to Amazon brings more sellers onto Amazon, which provides more selection, which makes for a better customer experience. And if you have a better customer experience, there'll be more traffic. And if you have more traffic, there'll be more sellers, etc. And and as that grows. What Amazon is really looking to do is to is to lower the cost structure. So they they want to they want to use that those economies of scale to lower the cost structure and then lower the prices further, which drives more a better customer experience, which then drives the traffic. So you get really this accelerating um, accelerating um, uh, flywheel virtuous cycle. And so Amazon leaders are really trained to look for these virtuous cycles. When you're having con when you're having discussions with Amazon leaders, they're looking their pattern matching for what is the virtuous cycle to invest in and so if you look at any amazon business you're going to see you're going to see this pattern that you know with you know uh amazon video prime video for example more viewers brings more content more 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 companies are, are putting their uh videos on amazon prime which then prime video which then provides more selection which provides a better customer experience which then drives more traffic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are opportunities to lower the cost structure, which allows them to offer that service at a lower and lower and lower price, which then again, accelerates customer adoption, which drives traffic. And so an example of this that's you know, really classic is actually AWS itself. AWS, AWS grew out of Amazon recognizing that lots of teams were building basically the equivalent of S3 or EC2. They, they made it into a product, they provided it to customers, and then those addi additional customers using AWS itself, AWS itself, then drove more traffic, which then, you know, like, which, which, which then improved the technology, which improved the results, which improved the customer experience, which improved the traffic. And so then with that economy of scale, they could lower, lower their cost structure, they could get higher utilization in the data centers, ultimately rebuilding lots of infrastructure. Um, 
And so, so AWS is actually more of a business innovation and, 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 and really less of a technical one, if you think about it. So one of the things that this drives, which is a little unusual for many of us working in tech, is that it, it loves a low profit margin. It's a high volume, low profit margin business. So if you look at you know, the various companies that, the, that, that some of the AWS, the Amazon business units are, are competing against, um, what you'll see is that the profit margins, like, like some of the tech companies are high profit margin companies. So these are, the, these are by the way, the, the profit margins from the couple, couple of quarters back. So the tech companies are high profit margin businesses, whereas Amazon is a low profit margin business, much more like CVS than, than, than Apple, for example, in terms of its profit margin. And that, that sounds a bit insane, but, 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 it, but, it, but it, it makes it back up on, on volume. Right. So an example of this is S3. So S3 um, uh, you know, is constantly refactoring for agility, constantly uh, refactoring for availability, cost, durability, security, which, which drives more customers to the service, which then allows them to lower the cost because they get better utilization. And then that, that drives more customers back to the service again. So an example of that is this recent S3 fact, refactor. So they, they redesigned S3 to provide read after write uh, consistency as opposed to eventual consistency. And that was aimed at drive at lowering cost for customers, but also the, the internals of S3. Okay. And that was actually done with the help of automated reasoning, right? So th and this is kind of a, a uh, by the way, that was the SOSB. Um, and this is an, a trend that I began to recognize is that automated reasoning helps the business refactor itself. And it's constantly, because it's a low profit margin business, high volume business, trying to get higher and higher volumes, they are constantly having to rewrite and formal methods really helps out there. So EC2 is another example, constantly refactoring for availability, carbon footprint, cost, security. There was a recent refactor, they rebuilt the entire stack from the hardware to the networking, to the virtualization, you know, the, the hypervisor, et cetera. And, and that was really aimed at reducing cost. And that, you know, again, was, was done with the help of automated reasoning. So it was accelerated with, with automated reasoning. Now, these, these cycles, where, where things get really interesting is these cycles are composable, right? So, you know, teams can plug together. Teams, uh, to Amazon teams are customers of, of, of other Amazon teams. And what that means is that if you're working in a, uh, doing, for example, formal methods in a, in a team that's not directly customer facing, you're still driving an improved customer experience for those that are customer facing. And that's a really important concept within, within Amazon. So AWS, for example, is used by Amazon Prime. And uh, so thus any work we're doing on the TLS implementation or proving the correctness of the um, read after write consistency uh, 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 protocols or, or reasoning about the, the, the EC2 infrastructure, et cetera, that's improving the customer experience for, for Amazon Prime. Um, and so really you can think of Amazon as a, a composition of these small uh, businesses that are all trying to find the, these, these, vir these virtuous cycles. Another really interesting aspect of this is that it, is that it you know, you, you can influence what other teams are doing because a lot of them kind of have the same pattern. They're all trying to refactor themselves and, and, and grow in that way. So, so if you have success in, with one team, other teams are gonna see that success and begin to copy it. And so from there, the news spreads. And that's really what's happened at Amazon is we got success with a couple of teams and then other teams saw that success. They saw other teams able to move faster, able to deploy faster, able to lower their cost structure even more. And those leaders of those other organizations were like, wow, I want some of that too, and began to look at how to invest in their space. Now, uh, formal methods or, or, other, or other sciences also are a virtual cycle which can be composed. So the science team can be attached to the technology and then, and then, and then iterate. And what happens is that, you know, like for example, with our, on, on SMT, we're getting billions of requests daily to to you know that, that to our our SMT and other and other and other tools, and so that's creating an environment for the scientists working on the science teams, where like every day is like SMT comp or SB comp or SAP comp, right? So new scientific questions are emerging from the pain points of those automated reasoning tools that are that are taking 
um, pretty incredible uh, amounts of traffic. And then we're able to refactor the, the cost structure of those tools. So, and this is where things start to feel really, this is where I'm getting really, really excited about, about where we stand right now, because we're really you know, able to fund new jobs and new radical algorithms and hardware that, that were really unimaginable before. So I'll give you an example that's quite close to my heart, something that you know, I'm personally working on myself, which is um, you know, distributing uh, automated reasoning. So, so here, for example, is uh, all of the SAT solvers 2002 to 2020 um, on the same data and same hardware, the 2020 SAT competition benchmark suite. And so you, you'll, you, may, you may have seen a graph similar to this, but the, the point is, is that every year, even on fixed hardware and fixed um, benchmarks, the tools are getting better and better and better. So it's a fundamental, SAT is fundamentally getting better, which is very exciting. Uh, but these are all single microprocessor solvers. So if you, if you allow distributed SAT, then things are even much more dramatically interesting. So Malib Mono 20 is, is uh, really a blowout success when you compare that um, to what you can get with a single, single microprocessor, right? And so, uh, so we're now able to exploit that in the cloud in a way that, that we really couldn't have done before. So we're, we're exploring algorithms right now that really would have been unthinkable before. And maybe we'll get to the, to the point someday where we're building our own hardware for, for these tools and if we can hit that uh, sort of economy of scale. And that has happened, for example, in EC2, where they're building their own microprocessors because they are able to get better operations, better security, uh, better efficiencies by, by building their own hardware than the commodity. So watch this space. I think that you're gonna see over, over the coming years, pretty exciting publications uh, in, the, in the area of like fundamentally new cloud infrastructures for, for automated reasoning. So why, why has Amazon been so successful in, in, uh, in for all methods? So one of the reasons is that it's really a fundamentally different kind of business than the businesses that many of us in formal methods have been have been working with before. It's a it's a low profit margin, high volume business, as opposed to a lot of businesses we've been operating with before, which were lower volumes, high profit margin. And that drives this idea of a virtual cycle and automated reasoning fits in really, really nice with that, with that business model. So um so I guess the the you know if I try and extract that from outside of Amazon, I think that. What we've seen, you know, in the past, like with device drivers or or after the floating point division bug or these kinds of things, that to be successful in the space commercially, you you really have to find alignment with the business strategy and the problems. And I that I mean that I guess that's obvious, and I, I would imagine that many of you watching this talk agree with that. But I'm constantly blown away at how fundamental that is and that it's very tricky to make you get huge accelerating positions if you can find those business problems that are really fundamental to the to the to the survival of the company um and and, and then 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 you're, then you're really in great shape and you really need to take advantage of its quirks it's it's kind of odd ways of, of seeing the world and if you can fit into that cycle then 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 in my experience you know things take off so that's that's one of them so the next one is the this idea of the working backwards process so, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to delve too much into this point, but I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the formal methods, the labs that invested in formal methods in the past have not been obsessed with the application. I myself, am, have, and this has been true, right? I have been very interested in the algorithms and the techniques. And then we were looking for applications to kind of drive to drive the, to, to fund things, to, to be frank, right? And that creates this, um, counterintuitively, it creates a situation where, where, where things aren't gonna, aren't gonna go as well, let me say it that way. So you kind of have this sort of virtuous cycle imbalance, right? You have slower velocity of data and funding because you're not focusing on the application as much as you're focusing on, focus on the underlying algorithms. And so it's counterintuitive that if you really, really love the algorithms, you have to really focus on the application to get the funding for the application for the for the, for the algorithms. And if you and, and if you don't do that, you're not going to get to do what you, what you want to do as, as fast, right? It, the the science gets stagnant. Otherwise, I mean, it's probably 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 a bit extreme, but that's kind of my opinion. So so it's I I love this uh, straight sheet philosophy, right? That 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 the separation of practical and theoretical work is artificial and injurious, right? That that 
the practical work done in computing is you know unsound and clumsy, and the theor theoretical work, the abstract work that is sterile because it doesn't know it doesn't have any point of contact with real computing. It doesn't they don't know what folks don't know what to work on, and so what Amazon's culture is designed to do that they are aware that most people coming in who are technologists are much more obsessed with the technology than they are the application. So much of Amazon's culture is, dri is driving the technologist to, to really focus on the application, knowing that the, the mindset of the people that, that they're hiring are fundamentally gonna rebalance and there's gonna be a balance between the technology and the application. So they're really driving on the application hard such that there's good balance, such that the system moves faster and faster and faster. Um, and um, yeah, so I said all that. Um, so, so an example of that, and there's many mechanisms in Amazon that do this, but one of the examples is called the working backwards process. I, I really can't overstate the importance of this and, and how tremendous this has been uh, kind of figuring this process out. So most ideas in Amazon begin first with the press release that you'll send to uh, the major newspapers when you're done. And I'm really not kidding. Like, the, like you, you first write the press release and you end up shopping this press release around to all of the different stakeholder teams that you're going to need to work with to get the thing done that you're trying to get done and you you iterate over the messaging that you would send to the to the, to the major to the major newspapers and the reason this is, i think this is so important is that it drives consensus about why and interpolates the value of the work to to the right place to drive the, to drive the funding for the project later on when you're going down when you're going down and building it. So it's something analogous to writing the abstract of the paper before you even begin the work in some way. And it's and it and it really pushes us out of our comfort zone, which makes for better science. So this is an example of a paper that I don't think we would have thought of in a million years if we hadn't written the press release. So this actually really came from the press release. So us, you know, formal methods nerds wrote a press release no one liked it no one got it as we were shopping it around we got a lot of pushback on on how it was written and and what it was saying and and where we landed ultimately after achieving consensus across the organization was with essentially with this with the idea that's in this paper so um so and then there's another benefit to discuss this which is pretty interesting working backwards this, this working backwards concept helps team science teams scale which is really i think a uh, in many ways, an, uh, an unsolved problem in our, in our in our field, which is how to get very large organizations, all the formal methods people, kind of working uh, together. So you know, we have all of these areas that we're working in, like storage and identity and protocols and cryptography, et cetera. And they're all and they're all these you know spinning flywheels themselves. And then we have all of these scientists that you know working in these different these different businesses. So how 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 do we get them to collaborate with each other. Well, it's this, it's this customer model, right? So the science team from one group needs to partner with the science team from the other group to, to get that value, customer value. So a lot of it is driven by what, what is the customer value or that working backwards process. So science cl collaboration happens between teams. So an example of that is Zvonimir, who's in the identity team, needed features from Daphne so Zvonimir worked on tools um, from the identity space that then were ultimately ad ad adopted by the Daphne team and, and, and folks like Rustin, but we really came backwards from what the customer, in this case Zvonimir, needed. So we were really working on what, what, what the customer needed backwards as opposed to writing something and throwing it over the wall, all the, over the wall to Zvonimir. Another example of that is Dehan, who's uh, working in reasoning about policies, and Bruno, who's working on um, the underlying SMT SAT infrastructure, and 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 uh, same thing. We had a, we had a sort of a, a, a customer facing goal about driving timeouts uh, uh, down to zero for some for some applications, and so so each team and individual can work on behalf of their cycle uh, and collaborate with the others. So this this division of working backwards from the customer. And these virtuous flywheels create an environment where collaboration seems much to me much much easier. That's that's been my experience. Um, and so the working backwards process really glues these relationships together. Um, and then also movement amongst the virtual cycles is easy and encouraged because of this 
view of trying to work on what's the customer value and then everyone always trying to sort of align where they're at and what they're working on based on what's the best leverage for them to try and bring the most value, value to customers. So you see a pretty frequent movement around, around these teams. So the, the, the teams that are, are sort of, they have their own businesses and they're, they have their own plans and agendas, but then what you see is staff kind of moving around um, as, as, as they like to, to work on the d different problems that are sort of best leverage for them to work on. Um, all right. Good. So why, why sorry. Um, so so uh, why has Amazon been successful, so successful in formal reasoning and others haven't in the software space? Another area, another, another point here is this working backwards process, which keeps that virtual, those virtuous cycles balanced. And spinning, so you, the, it's it's not just the technology you're focused on, but it's also also the customer experience. And because there's balance between them, then then things move faster, they accelerate, uh, and then and then more and more exciting science happens. Um, okay, so the the point, you know, if I try and interpolate that outside of the Amazon culture, uh, as much as I don't love this. You know, I, I, I am a card carrying technology obsessed person, but if you, if you only obsess about the technology and then look for the application, it's think the funding is not gonna come quite as well. It's like the, the application, when you, when, you, when you plug into an application, you get breathtaking amounts of funding. Let me say it that way. Okay, at least at Amazon, that's, that's been my experience. So, okay, so here's, a, here's another one. This is Amazon's idea of a continuous delivery model. So Amazon pushes for incremental continuous improvement rather than moonshots. And this is really fundamental to how Amazon sees things. And this is kind of where, in many ways, it's actually quite sympathetic to the, to the, um, to the automated reasoning worldview. So we in, in the formal methods community are comfortable with the idea that we're working on undecidable or intractable problems. And so we know we're not gonna ever solve the problem. We, we know, Fundamentally, we can't solve that unless P equals MP, right? But what we can do is every year make the tools better and better and better. And that is a very Amazonian view of how things work. So rather than make some moonshot where it's all or nothing, and then once you're done, you're done. Instead, every day, every week, every month, every year, you make things increase by, and so a lot of, in Amazon, a lot of the, the language is around, um, Month after month over month, week over week, year over year uh, improvements. So yeah, fifty percent year over year improvement, thirty percent month over month improvement. The, this is the, the this is the kind of language that's being used a lot, and that's that's the, the kind of language I think that uh, many of us in the uh, you know in SAT SMT model checking that we're we're we're, we're fairly comfortable with because that's kind of the, the space we've been operating in. But but the but the the, the um, Amazon takes us perhaps a bit further. So, so the, the idea of a moon charge, right? Like, let's go to the moon. Um, and then the, the Amazon viewpoint was like, let's build a moonshot ladder. And what does that mean? That means we're going to build a ladder to the moon, but every rung, every step on the ladder has to bring meaningful customer value. Something that will make that if you, if you show this to people who don't understand the bigger picture, they'll be excited by that too. That's really fundamental, right? So um, each rung of the ladder should be something that gives actual customer value. So for an example of this um, uh, in, Am in the full method team at Amazon, so we developed some you know, pretty rudimentary tools, frankly, um, that very few organizations could use. But guess what? Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund, logged me in, Goldman Sachs, they were able to use it because they had you know, when you go and talk to Goldman Sachs, you're gonna to talk to lots of people who took courses under Andrew Appel, for example. And so they, they have enough expertise where they can use these tools that require you understand first order logic to use them. And so we, what we got is we got enterprise customers using these tools, uh, which, which, with, which then we got feedback on, right? We got feedback on those tools, but we also got experience operating those tools. And then we began to try and put them in the hands of customers that weren't the Goldman Sachs and weren't the Bridgewater Associates. So this, we, we got, we got, we made a better customer experience. We moved the needle on customer experience. 
but we also drove investment to the science. So with the, the wins from Bridgewater Associates and Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs and some of, some of these other big enterprise customers, we we're able to fund more science, do more, and then that just kept, kept things going, right? So then we did, we did a little bit more, right? So, so, it's a, so then we launched a publicly facing paid, uh, or actually free service uh, uh, called IM Access Analyzer. There was a, there was a, there was a big launch. Uh, it's part of the press release. You know, there was a big, strong demand from the the more average customer. A lot of people want to understand the fundamentals. So here are some folks explaining how automated reasoning works to uh, you know a fairly sizable set of um, uh, you know te technical folks from 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 different AWS customers. Um, and it was very popular. You know, I mean, you know, in Twitter and and the, and the IT press, and that just keeps going on and on and on. So we're forever making that tool better, making it do more things forever. We're never done. And so that's that's the you know it keeps getting better, and better and better. And then uh, Amazon has built into it ideas like like conflict clauses. So they have this process of you move fast, you may not, you may make mistakes. And when you mistakes, you do something called a correction of errors. You, you write down what were the lessons. You basically write down what were the conflict clauses, what were the things that you learned, and then you share them across the company. So anyone in the company can go uh, and look at the, 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 the lessons learned from the mistakes that, you're, that, you, that your team has made. And so that in Amazon, there's this concept of five whys, which is really computing the conflict clause, ultimately, if you sort of look at it in that way. Um, and so we do, basically the point I'm making is that we take the time to do root cause analysis during this continuous evolution. And that's really baked into the, um, into the, into the culture. Um, and so what we find is that the process, you know, here now I have Mars, not the moon. So we, 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 we invariably aim for the moon, but we very rarely get to the moon because along the way, we get continuous feedback from customers and continuously sort of change actually what we're even doing based on the feedback from customers. And so they, so you, so you end up going to different places that are, that are, that are really unexpected. So here are three papers that I really would have never expected we would write. Certainly I, when we set out to build some of these tools, this was not where we were going. Um, but all of these came from direct, these were uh, solutions to problems that came from pivots in the team that were addressing direct customer feedback, literally in, in rooms with customers saying, hey, could you do this? Could you do that? We're like, oh, actually, that's super interesting. And we began to do that and then challenges emerged. And then these papers came out of that. Um, so, so an example is uh, uh, debugging networks using Insight cores, um, uh, automated reasoning for threat modeling, um, and uh, this kind of pretty interesting thing. So the S3, right, which is, certainly one of the world's largest services in its main API has an SMT solver in it. So how, it's a highly available API. So, so how, do you, how do you build S3 such that it's aware of the fact that the SMT solver may go to launch from time to time because it's trying to solve intractable problems. So that's, that's what that paper is about. Um, and then you learn really surprising things from customers. So here's a big one that's really, really surprising. It was surprising to me at the time. It's not, not anymore. We heard frequently, I don't care about bugs. I want to know what's true and untrue of my organization's systems. So this is soundness. They're saying, I don't care about bugs. I want to know what's true. And, and what, what, we, what we realized is that the enterprise, the executives at enterprise customers, the Goldman Sachs, the Bridgewater Associates, et cetera, want to know what's true. They don't, they don't, they don't, they're not. They don't want to hear about tools that sort of help developers find bugs 5% faster, 10% faster. What they want to know is they want a, a tool to be run and then them to be able to say something meaningful after they run it. Okay, so why, why has Amazon been so successful in formal reasoning when others haven't? Well, I think it's this um, uh, continuous deliver, delivery model. Customer, uh, frequent customer interaction increases the velocity of these cycles. These like technology to customer to technology to customer, um, which you know increases our the, the the frequency of doing these this sort of working backwards process. So every time we're saying, "Oh, we're going to build this new thing," or "We're going to there's this new feature or this new way of seeing the world," we end up writing or working backwards 
document, shopping it around amongst all the people, getting some clarity, getting some consensus, and then building. And so the 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 more we implement this continuous model, the the more frequently writing these docs, and thus the more frequently we're getting clarity as an organization about what we should be working on. Um, and so from from the outside Amazon perspective. Uh, I don't know exactly how to adapt this, but the continuous delivery model has been surprisingly great as a scientific environment. I'll, I'll say that. So I don't know if that if there needs to be changes in funding models or, or how to or how to interpolate that to the academic um, uh, uh, setting, but, but but that's an observation I have. Okay, uh, leadership principles. Okay, so here's a really interesting one. So um, ultimately. Amazon has very few rules and it has 14, now 16 leadership principles. So the leadership principles are really the DNA of the company. Everything runs by the leadership principles. And, 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 the, um, and the, you, you can find them here on amazon.jobs. Uh, it's the company's DNA. Uh, here's an example of what I'm talking about. So it's an Amazon, it's a leadership principle called bias for action. And the idea is that speed matters. Right? So many decisions are reversible and you don't need extensive study. So we value um, calculated risk-taking. So that's, that's the wording. So this is the leadership principles are a name with a bit of wording around it. That's, that's the idea of leadership principles. And there's 16 of them. And the point is, is that this is, this is the culture of the company. This is what, this is the, everyone who works in the company needs to be strong on these, on these leadership principles. And the, and the, and the, and the, the, the observation is, is that if your organization has individuals that are strong uh, in these in these principles, the organization will do the right thing, and it will scale fairly naturally with with very little uh, very little oversight. So for this one in particular is basically non-blocking concurrency for organizations and humans, right? So unless what you're going to do is a crossing a one-way door, just do it, figure it out. Like you don't need to ask too much permission. The interviews are based on them. Promotions are based on them. The employee performance management measurement is based on them, and I actually hear them, you know, hourly. Like I'm not kidding, right? They, 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 in every meeting, you're, you're, these these they're being referred to by name. Um, and so the goal that 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 these are the problem that these are trying to solve is how do you distribute decision making as deeply in the leaves of the organization as possible? How do you create not a top down organization where the senior people say this is what we're doing? Make it done, but but all of those decisions move to the hands-on keyboard uh, developers. That's that's what, what they're really what they're looking for, and, that, and that's what they get out of this. So each team and individual should be as autonomous as possible, and the leadership principles are, are, are how that's done. Um, and so really, Amazon is a distributed system with with people. Okay, so here they all are. There won't really be time to go 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 into all of them, but I'm going to give you a few examples. From a, from a methods perspective about why this is so important. So uh, I think many of us here will, this will be a familiar concept to you, right? You're, you're trying to convince someone to use an automated, proof formal methods, automated reasoning, whatever you want to call it. So right? this is a, a quote that's probably come out of your mouth many times, depending on how long you've been in the field. Um, and a very common thing you're going to hear from people who aren't specialists is things like, you know, go away, get off my turf. I don't, this isn't a priority for me. I don't get it. It's not interesting, whatever, right? So how do you respond to that? How do you respond to that in a normal organization? You're kind of stuck, right? The, all the organizations I've worked in previously, this was sort of a no-go. It was like a doors closed, pretty hard, pretty hard to get someone uh, interested if this is their, their kind of first response. But in Amazon, you have the customer obsession leadership principle, which you can appeal to. And people trigger, they pattern match on this, they trigger on They're like, oh, yeah, 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 we're customer obsessed. So, you, you know, leaders start with the customer and they work backwards. They, they work vigorously to earn and keep a customer trust. And, and although, of course, you know, like we, we pay attention to competitors, we obsess over customers. So we're not worried about what competitors are doing or worried about what the customers are doing. And so here I can re remind them that this is true and then bring to them feedback from customers saying, you know, Goldman Sachs or Bridgewater Associates or these other companies. When, when, you know, when we've been involved in these conversations, they, 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 this, was a, this was important work, work to them. And so that tends to get your average uh, Amazonian kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's right. So we, 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 should, we should work on this. Okay, so what's the customer need? And kind of have that discussion. 
Um, another one is like, I don't get it. Can't be bothered. Don't, don't, I don't want to know about this. Sounds too hard. Um, oh, okay. So we have another leadership principle, learn and be curious. So leaders are never done. Um, they're always trying to seek, they're always trying to improve themselves. They're always curious. They're always looking at possibilities and they're acting on behalf of customers to try and learn new things so they can implement new ideas. Oh, okay. So th they'll come, th you'll get them back to the table. They're like, okay. So, you know, like, is there some information that wouldn't take me too long to, to read, to try and understand what this is. Um, and so most people in the organization are very strong with regards to these. And this is how we've, this is how formal methods have been um, so widely adopted, in, in, in my opinion. So it, it makes it vastly easier to do good science in the space. Um, a few more is, you know, insist on the highest standards. Uh, is sort of the way you uh, re respond to people saying, can't we get away with less? Can't we just do fuzzing? Um, think big. Leadership principle is kind of how I respond to, well, no one else does this. When I look at the industry, no one else is doing it. So yeah, but I mean, we think big, right? We're, we're well, thinking small is a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can, we, we should and can create bold directions and think differently and look around the corners on behalf of customers. Um, earns trust is how you respond to, you know, people don't usually notice if there's a bug. No one cares if there's a bug. Ah, uh, come on, you know, like, we're trying to earn trust with our customers, but it's not, it's not, it's not good enough to just say, oh, they didn't notice, um, et cetera. So you, you, I think you get the idea. So why has Amazon been so successful in formal reasoning when others in the software space have been less so? I think uh, the leadership principles are absolutely fundamental. And the leadership principles make a more co collaborative, productive, and easy environment where we're able to achieve group consensus using things like the working backwards process which allows us to quickly iterate, right? So which is this continuous uh, uh, delivery model, which allows us to build and operate uh, these, these virtuous cycles, which is really in line with, with the Amazon um, business model. Um, so yeah, so that, that those, the goals were to try and find models that can be used out of, outside of Amazon. I mean, I, I hope I've sort of set your mind to thinking about them. I, you know, there's, there's there's thoughts about how that how that could be applied in universities or applied in start other startups or uh, uh, institutes and so on. Um, thoughts for for folks starting out their career. Thoughts for for those of you who are sending your students to Amazon for jobs and and thoughts for those of you uh, uh, wor working working with Amazon. I did I did want to close with a few thoughts on the um, the challenges. So. Uh, Un unsoundness in our tools are really deadly. It's what, what I am seeing in cases is that uh, people in the formal reasoning space have become, there, there was a big vision and they've sort of become disenchanted or disillusioned. And they've decided to use these tools perhaps for a bit less, which I get. And I, and I get that we wanna build trust with, you know, people that helping people find bugs, but we shouldn't lose sight of the bigger picture, which is we're, we're uniquely as a community, we're really the only community that's positioned to help the world make universal statements about what is true and untrue in our systems. And that's what Amazon leadership loves. I, if I go to them and say, you know, I can find bugs 20% faster, they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. But the, the like, they're, they're like, like we have, we have ex extensive penetration testing budgets and huge security teams and testing and they, they do all that, right? But for them, what's really unique about what we can do, the capability we can bring um, and the reason they put up with all the quirks of, you know, the personality quirks of formal methods nerds is because we, we, we we're in the position to make universal statements and prove them to be true. And so the, 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 uns the, the, the unsound, that the cutting corners in the tools ha harms us. Um, another area that's harming us is the predict, and this is sort of you know, like ultimately unsolvable, but predictability and usability of our tools. So you make just a slight change in your code and the prover was able to solve it in 30 seconds and now it's gonna be three weeks. And 
engineering teams that have really no experience in formal methods. This is just, they, they can't wrap their head around this. And so I think we're in the, you know, like just applying portfolio solving in the cloud, but also like sharing conflict clauses or other techniques that sort of use the breathing room that's afforded by uh, data centers. I think, well, I mean, we for sure we're seeing that this really smooths this out, but being aware of this is, this is a super important problem. So, um, and, and it's hard and it's harming adoption right now uh, amongst teams. So teams have to be very brave to take on these tools because what will happen is they, they get approved through, they're trying to launch, they're trying to release. And the week before the launch of the release, suddenly the tools break and, it, and, it's, and it's because they changed some code. The code's equally as correct as it was before, but suddenly the tool, the automated engineering tools just go to lunch and now everyone's staring at us. And, and that, 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 har that, that harms our reputation. Um, another problem we have, and this is partially our fault, is that, that the formal methods field is ultimately shrinking right now. I think, particularly in America, fewer people are teaching it. There's less, there's less, I think there's gonna, that it's gonna net it out that there's fewer students going into this area and, we're, and certainly the hiring we've done has pulled people out of the teaching. And that's, that's a problem that, that you know, we're, we're, you know, certainly I'm really invested in trying to solve this myself. Let me say it that way. Um, another, another observation is that the competitions are perhaps, I mean, this is sort of no secret, but they're not maybe incentivizing quite the right tools and research, right? The, uh, you know, example of this is, for us, it's absolutely crucial that the SMT solvers and SAS solvers produce auditable proofs, right? Produce proof witnesses that can be checked with an independent tool like Lean or, you know, um, Hall Light or something like that. And um, you get pretty big pushback from the developers of tools because they're afraid about how that's going to affect their performance in the competition. And while I get that tension, if you sort of look at the bigger picture, like winning, winning, winning S and T comp is not necessarily making the world a better place. What what's making the world a better place is making tools that that you're able to deploy in situations such that planes don't fall out of the sky. And so I, I get the I get the I get the value of the competition, and I, and I think in many ways that's why we're using S and T so so much now. But but we have to keep that in balance with the some of the other some of the other aspects and then the other thing that uh hits people when they join amazon from the academic world is that we just proving it once doesn't matter really it's a proof it's like it's like a you know it's like getting a pet right like you you now have to maintain that pet forever so you do a proof and a year from now and two years from now and three years from now you're going to that proof needs to mean that that proof has to live alongside the code and every change that's made to the code, um, the proof needs to be reestablished. And in fact, a lot of the value from the proof work comes two or three years later, when the original engineers maybe have gone to a different project and there's some new engineers, they don't really understand the invariance, but now the proof work sort of bakes into that work, the sort of assumptions about the, the, the invariants that are important. And then a developer at 2 a.m. happens to break them and now they're confused. Uh, so we, we have to make our tools uh, compatible with this with this viewpoint that really it's about the, the proof ops like the 3 a.m. call the proof is broken what do we do the uh, automatic or semi-automatic repair of proofs as the code evolves um, and repeatability right not not just getting lucky this is like kind of connects back to that butterfly effect right that it can't be that if you if the proof tool just happens to be lucky, the next change to the code, you're going to be not be lucky, and that's not a great situation. Um, okay, and uh, so with that, uh, thanks for your time and attention. And if you want to do an internship with us, if you're looking for a job with us, uh, you know, just send me your CV to Byron at Amazon, uh, and I'll and I'll leave you with pictures of, of some of our academic visitors and our more senior uh, folks you may know, and you can reach out to them too. And uh, I'd be happy to take uh, questions from there.
So uh, let me just check if we have any. Uh, yeah, uh, those of you on Zoom can uh, add to the chat if you have questions. So in the meantime, we'll be uh, taking the mic around here. Hi, Baron. Um, this is Nick Swami. A great talk. Thank you. Um, Nothing. Um, I'm wondering about your comment on the, the profit margin thing. And uh, uh, at least from the outside, it seems like, it, and I wonder how accurate this is, that, that Amazon you know, is, is perhaps at least two, if not more, distinct businesses with AWS and the retail side. And you know, profit margins on the AWS side are probably much higher than the 5% you noted, right? So um, uh, yeah, what do you make of that? I mean, the, the tools that you're, you're building and deploying, I presume, are impacting primarily AWS. Uh, I know we've had a lot of success in other spaces. So for example, Prime Video, um, the, you know, some of the drone work, there's, 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 there's uh, the uh, consumer payments um, devices. So a, a, a lot of growth there for sure. The higher profit margin, so the, the mindset is not about the profit margin. It's it, in business meetings, you're not seeing um, business leaders saying to other business leaders, like we need to increase the profit margin. That's not the mindset. The mindset is, is we need to lower costs for customers. And so a, if you have a high profit margin, actually the, the standard thing in Amazon to do would be to lower that cost because that's actually going to make your business better. But yeah, for sure. There's the, the AWS, I, I, those numbers are broken out. I, I actually don't track them super closely, but I, for, for sure, the AWS profit margins are going to be higher than some of the other business uh, units, but, but the, the, the mindset still holds that the, the AWS leaders are not driving for a high profit margin. And, and so that, Mindset to me, the thing that really surprised me, so I, you know, I always wanted to be in a high profit margin business because I'm like, oh, the high profit margin business will be able to fund the work I want to do. They'll be able to fund the research lab um, from the profit margin to do the cool stuff I want to do. And the thing I've been found surprising is that places where they're, they're printing money, they don't need to evolve the software. It's pretty hard to get people to evolve the software, which then means they don't. You know, well, we've just, we've made a, a, a very viable business in automated reasoning within Amazon of helping teams that are constantly re need to rebuild and be more aggressive, write, write code that's doing things that's surprising that allows them to, to lower costs. So that, that's, that, 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 that's a, a relationship that, that to me, it was quite unexpected. So I'll get to that. So Rod, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi. I hope you can hear me, guys. Um, yeah. It's Rod Chapman here in Bath. Your final slide, Byron, really resonated with me. And it's lovely to hear somebody talk about soundness and so, talk about the importance of soundness, because I've been told for 20 years that it didn't matter and it was the wrong way to go. And, you know, and you talked about unsoundness in tools being deadly. Um, but something I often come across is that a lot of the notations we deal with, mostly programming languages, but also specification notations and natural languages are riddled with undefined behavior and riddled with ambiguity. And they kind of come with unsoundness built in and there's nothing you can do about it. So, so can you tell us what you're doing in the programming language design space to try and improve that situation? Yeah, so we're... we're we've hired a lot of the rest. There's no accident. We've hired a lot of people in rest <laughs> <laughs> and it's no, you know, it's no accident that uh, we have Coretto, which is our own um, JV, J, you know, JDK stack. So that's, um, it's, it's a fundamental problem. And I, and yeah, it's an area of, uh, you know, it's an area of stress. It's an area of worry. 
that so what so one of the things we have to be very careful about is 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 tracking the assumptions we're making in the proofs right because mm -hmm. what, what 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 people get confused about like myself included right is you know on a bad day i'm saying to people oh hey you, you know testing is worthless you don't need to do testing and i'm like i have to remind myself ah hold on testing is also checking the jdk or the rust runtime it's also checking the microprocessor and it's also ch checking the you know the just all the entire environment so testing is checking really a different dimension so when you do a proof one of the reasons it can be so incredibly fast and that's that's one way i talk about proof is a much more efficient way to get complete state-based coverage than in than enumeration and I, I tend to actually say let's take this policy and look at what if you through all possible requests of the policy, how long would it take you to uh, to search enumerably? And it's like, oh, and it, the number is like always oh, insane number of lifetimes of the sun. And people are like, oh, wow, that's crazy. And I was like, yeah, we can do it in you know five seconds. And they're like, wow, it's super valuable. But then I have to remind them, ah, but one thing we're losing is when you're doing that testing, you're actually checking the microprocessor, you're actually checking the network stack, you're actually checking the runtime, the Java garbage collector, et cetera. Whereas we're able to abstract, we make the assumption that the programming language at runtime is correct when we do this proof. So, so it's a, so you're able to say, you're able to say cleanly with, with formal methods, if the tools themselves are sound, that you know, under under environment assumptions, you know what you know. But then you do need to be clear about what the environment assumptions are. And then what we've found is that we're able to use those models to drive testing. So, so for example, in the, um, you know, in the storage space, we reason deductively about the protocols, the power of the complex distributed systems protocols that run you know, storage systems like S3. But then how do we connect that to a lot of the lower level details? Ah, oh, we use those models to drive testing. Mm -hmm. And so we, so we use mixtures of testing and, and formal methods. And so we don't have to boil the ocean. We can do, we can, that there are parts that developers are, are worried about that they're like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm really ahead of my skis on this one. So help me make sure that I'm getting this right. Okay, so we, we come in and we're able to do proofs. And then the parts about the language runtime, well, you know, I mean, there, there might be problems in the language runtime. All, cost, all companies, all devices are gonna suffer from those potential problems, but it allows us now to focus our testing effort on those things. And then we can choose to prioritize proofs on those too. So it may, it may be that you know in the future we do proofs about language runtimes for for a for a certain uh, language that then becomes you know the, the the language of choice for people who are real obsessed about proof. And so we what you're also going to see if you look at the Daphne um, you know changes to, to Daphne in the uh, an open source repository is a lot of is a, is a lot of work. The fundamentals of Daphne, so that so, so Daphne is an area where we're invested quite heavily. I mean, we're also we're doing compilation from Daphne to other languages, like you know, um, C and Java and JavaScript and C Sharp and you know, Go and et cetera, et cetera. So these are these are sort of you know, there, there's a sorry, I'm I'm rambling. There's a there's a there's a stack, and we have to focus on certain pieces of the stack, and then use traditional techniques where where we're not applying formal methods in that stack. Fair. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Shankar, are there further questions? Thank you. That was a great talk. Best talk this in a week of good talks. Uh, that's the best talk I've heard this week and for several months at least. So thank you. Wow. wow. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you mentioned early on this working backward process, where you said you would write the press release first, and you mm -hmm. said that led to an interesting paper that you wouldn't have written otherwise. Yeah. Could you say a bit about what was in that paper? Yeah. So this. So um, it's a CAV paper from two years ago, I think. It's one of the calves that were in LA. Um, and so the paper, the, basically the, the idea of the paper is, so, so what we did when we, went, when we went to these, you know, 
banks, right? With this, like, you know, like I, I've worked at Amazon for eight weeks. I have a SMT. I can do all, I have all these tools, you know, I can solve your problem, right? So we, we have like, there, one of the big problems is like reasoning about the semantics of policies. Great. I can do that reduction to SMT. And so, you know, our, our starting point was tell us what you want to prove and we'll prove it. That's the, that's the traditional formal methods viewpoint. And with these big banks, that was fine. They were like, oh, you know, they can brush up a little bit on first order logic and they can express things, no problem. But, you know, your, your average customer uh, is, isn't going to be able to, it's just kind of a no-go to, with the starting point is like, you know, ex, symbol, you know, express your thing symbolically. Like in, the, in, the, in the language of sort of, of um, reasoning about programs, you, you can't say, first you have to understand non-determinism, temporal logic, and assume statements to, to, to make progress uh, for, for a large scale. So what we uh, realized is that there was a, a common question that all customers had. So they had an account and they had resources, they had policies on resources in their account and they all wanted to know which principles outside of my account have access to principles inside of my account. And that's just a stand, that's a property that's a standard property. And we have a method of A, taking the policies, so examining, examining them syntactically to construct questions. And then we ask the developer, we ask the user questions. We say, hey, uh, here's a principle that would have access to this resource. Uh, are you okay with that? And they can choose yes or no. They can say, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Or no, I'm not okay with that. Let's archive that. Please help me fix that later. And there's a lattice of questions because if you ask one question that's very general, then you don't need to ask all the questions that are sort of basically instantiations of the same question. And so we, or, we ordered the questions of this family of questions that we're gonna ask developers such that that minimize that interaction. So we basically created a game in some, in some sense or a dialogue saying, what do you think about this? What do you think? So like a kid, you know, hey, what are we having for dinner? What, what are we having for breakfast? Where, where, where are we going? Why are we going there? Why are we doing that? It's like this sort of nagging discussion as opposed to, hey, first learn our first order logic, write down what you want and then we'll prove it. And, and we're not gonna provide really functionality to you to help make sure you got the, the original query correct. And so, yeah, so that's, that's that paper. Fantastic. What is the title, please? Oh, um, um, uh, email Byron at Amazon.com and I'll say your point. It has stratified in it and it's Andrew, Andrew Gasek is the, I think the first author on the paper. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's from uh, CAF 2020. Stratified policies, something in the title. Mukesh from University of Cambridge. Uh, excellent management lessons to tech people. My question is, when you first joined Amazon, how did you push formal methods to uh, these teams? You know, what was your selling point? Oh, if you could take us yeah. in time and then tell us a bit about your first experience. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I looked at you know, I've looked at the audience here. So so many many people have known me over the years and you know, many, many people here have known me for 20 plus 25 years. Um, and so they'll probably find this amusing. So, you know, I, I sort of reached this point where like how many more pop on PLDI and cap papers can I really write? And so I was like, I kind of wanted a new adventure. So I, I went to a place that wasn't really invested in this space at all. Uh, and I thought that I was going to just find a couple of things to, to work on and we just kind of see where it went. But I, my, I was absolutely breathtaking about how fast I moved. And here's how it happened. I, uh, you know, you know, you, you know, you know, for example, that Bill Gates is actually thanked in Greg Nelson's dissertation. So I, so I was actually, you know, when, when showing like my previous work, for example, someone like Bill Gates, he's like, wow, cool. It's awesome. I, I get this work. You know, I, I knew 
Greg Nelson. I, I actually introduced Greg Nelson into the into this area of ST, basically. I mean, I'm not I'm putting sort of words in his mouth, but so they understand that the the, the the leaders of other organizations often understand the tech very well because they, they're sort of technologists themselves. Uh, and so they're, they're you know interested in sort of dabbling in the science, but but they're that, that it's not they don't really think it was a business opportunity. So so I, I joined Amazon. I'm in uh, New York and London, uh, where where I where I live, and and I'm on a f I'm my my office is near a bunch of people who are in sales, and so the salespeople kind of hear uh, what I'm doing, and we're like, hey, do you want to go to some of these customers with us? And that was like two or three weeks in. So I said, sure. So I went and had lunch with some customers. And the CTO of a, of a major bank was like, um, oh, well, that's cool. You know, like, you know, in, a, in previous life, I kind of worked on DARPA things. Do you know John Launchberg? I said, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's actually my advisor. And then he, he was learning about what we were doing. And the, the key phrase that came out, and this is like say, six weeks in, eight weeks in to my, my time, was, oh, if you can prove that, we'll move orders of magnitude workload over to AWS. And the sales folks, their ears perked up. Wait, 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 what's that? And what was really interesting is that quote, I was able to go to different AWS leaders. You know, the people write, uh, Cole McCarthy, for example, is writing the S2N, which is the TLS implementation uh, that we use in Amazon at the time. And I said to him, this bank, Said we'll move orders of magnitude workload over to AWS if we can if we could prove something meaningful meaningful like the TLS implementation, and he's like then let's do it. He's like I'll I'll change every line of code. How do we do it? And basically that was the response I got from the people doing uh, policies, uh, net virtual networks, uh, protocols, KMS the key, man key management store, uh, crypto fundamentals virtualization, that, that was pretty much the message I got across the board. So it's that I had data from customers saying it was important to them. And the enterprise customer in particular was very excited and interested in this work because this was evidence to them that the cloud was a good investment. Um, and and the uh, service teams, the you know, EC2s, S3s, et cetera, were very quick to grasp the business opportunity if this was important to the customer and it was so all those sort of pieces fit together and to them you know a lot a lot of the leaders don't know what mp complete is don't know what an undecidable problem is but for them what they see is customers want it this guy says he can do it let's try it and so the amazon way is that they invest kind of in anything a little bit and if it works they'll just double they'll just keep doubling down on it so basically, I got that flywheel going, and then the, every year, essentially, we've you know doubled since then. Hi, Byron. Uh, this is Supratik. <clears throat> so, uh, do you have uh, occasions when when you realize that what was being asked by the customers was not something that could be delivered by formal methods. It's beyond, you know, what we have today in terms of the science. Yeah, and yeah, it happens. Yeah, a lot, and it's good news. I remember. Um, so there's a bunch of mechanisms in Amazon that sort of kick to me. Um, potential projects so you know every week there's you know reviews by the teams of you know fight of things that were found right like um uh the, a lot of things are built with um defense in depth so the sort of belt and suspenders approach there's multiple there's multiple mitigations but you know there will be uh new bugs found by penetration testers by by um, security researchers, and then we look we we look to see oh well, how's that impacting AWS, and and we review those, and um, and often during those reviews, uh, there are questions like oh wait a minute couldn't formal methods be used? And so I get involved in a lot. Of, I'm pulled into a lot of those conversations by the the CEO, the 
CTO, the chief information security officer, et cetera. And, and a lot of times it's like, I, I don't think that formal methods is really the right way to solve this. And that earns tremendous trust uh, amongst the leaders. If the, the science team is saying that probably isn't a good investment for us. And there's so many problems to solve that we can all keep everybody. There's you know five problems for every person. We don't need a sixth. So for them, it's great because they're getting really good value from the money they're spending on the people who help them navigate where where these kinds of techniques will will bring value and won't bring value. And uh, and 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 it's great for us because it's a constant source of like slightly getting us out of our comfort zone, right? It's like we're we're being asked questions that aren't being posed by formal methods people or being posed questions by people outside of our space. And often surprisingly like, oh, actually we could do something with that's quite interesting. Um, and so those turn into, into projects. Uh, questions, but we've uh, run out of time. And uh, okay. you know, so uh, thanks for, uh, you know, preparing a really nice uh, talk for us. It's you know really uh, stimulating, and I think uh, you know some of these are uh, issues that we've been actually discussing about uh, the the kind of outreach we can get with formal methods. You know, we have a kind of proof problem. How do we prove to others that we can deliver yeah. value? And uh, so you know, what what uh, the words of wisdom you have on this, I think, uh, will will. Uh, inform some of the discussion and some of the work that we do going ahead as well. Thanks awesome. a lot. Yeah, I, I wish I were there, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll see people over time, so. Yeah, uh, thanks for doing doing this virtually though. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, bye. Thanks. <laughs>